Yeah, you're now on the email. Oh, yeah. <laughs> takes his time. Oh, I had to agree to lunch. Mark Santana and that dude. How many people are on the about five or six. That's uh, Tom Doris chair. I certainly don't that one. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember. Uh, I'll let you know. I know. Well, you look at the You don't I don't know. I saw it online. Yeah, they saw it online. Someone asked me about the industrial building and what it like an event space. I said, well, what about that? Yeah. 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 It's our president. I know. It's so try to market it. And that's part of what led to me. I didn't establish the priorities and lessons and so forth. I always thought that building should be in. It is. With the, with the Coca-Cola icons on the uh, spandrel panels. Yeah. How about uh, I don't know what my schedule is anymore. Um, my life's not my own. It used to be, but it's not anymore. <laughs> Maybe Wednesday at 1 o'clock. Well, I think we're ready to get started. Good evening and welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. This is a wonderful turnout. We'll have a larger audience also on Facebook Live. They'll be able to view it anywhere in the world. Uh, and we often get several hundred people who view our programs uh, virtually if they can't be here in this room. So uh, we're very excited about that. This is part of our ongoing series of Fourth Monday educational programs, which we present most months throughout the year on the fourth Monday of the month. And this also happens to be the final week of Black History Month. And we often have a program uh, in February for Black History Month, and they've always been very well received and with a good turnout and with great presentations. So I'm sure this will be no uh, exception. I'm David Morrison. I'm the executive director of Historic Harrisburg. I think I know almost all of you. Uh, and uh, great to have you here with us. Um, let me just make a couple of quick announcements before we get started. Um, first of all, I want to express thanks to uh, Peggy Grove. Uh, she's the sponsor of tonight's program uh, and very generously uh, covering our expenses. Uh, refreshments are there, Com compliments of Peggy. Uh, so we're happy for that. Uh, I want to thank Barbara Barksdale, and I'm going to give her a more thorough introduction in just a moment, but she's not only a member of our education committee, but she put together tonight's program. Um, uh, we're going to be uh, talking, uh, oh, I know. Uh, we have a, two things which you can pick up in the back of the room on your way out. This is our uh, updated calendar of events, and this includes some things that we just added as recently as today, as well as next month's uh, fourth Monday program, uh, four weeks from tonight, which is for Women's History Month, a wonderful program about Violet Oakley and her artist uh, collaborators that were called the Red Rose Girls. And, and we have a top expert on that, uh, Carol Buck, uh, who works for the State Museum, uh, is going to be giving us that presentation on Monday, the 25th of March. Also, uh, we have uh, a gallery uh, open house of Third and the Bird for our exhibit out in the, uh, the main gallery there, which is a little difficult to see in the dark tonight, but if you come uh, on Friday, March 15th, you'll be able to come and see that exhibit, uh, meet the, the artist, photographer, Richard Jeffries and the, uh, the, the photographic artworks will be available for purchase. A number of other things in, in this calendar. And please visit our website for, for updates. 
uh, to, the, to the schedule because it's always being updated, added to, and so forth. Uh, and also, if you really want to keep up with what we're doing, this is our membership program. Now, I know many of you already are members of the Historic Harrisburg Association, but uh, uh, we invite and encourage you to be a member if you're not already, because that way you'll get information. You get our, our magazine <coughs> twice a year for free. That's included with your membership, as well as uh, timely announcements of all of our uh, activities and discounts on certain things that we do. So uh, it's, a, it's a great operation. Um, Oh, I wanted to mention, this is, who recognizes who this is? Caleb does. Anybody else recognize in this portrait here? Can you see it? Who is it, Caleb? Satchel Page. Satchel Page. This was just donated to us uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, a, a woman from Pittsburgh uh, donated to us. So with, with adding that to our, our uh, collection of... Hey, well, David, I can see, I saw him pitch you on the island, him? yes. Mm -hmm. So, I want to mention, several of us were uh, at the wonderful program uh, which closed yesterday uh, at Gannett Theater about the Jackson Rooming House. How many of you got a chance to see that? Wasn't that just amazing? Yes. Uh, yes. So that really, you know, we're so pleased to start Harrisburg was able to provide a little bit of help terms of the history that was that went into that, but boy, they did an amazing job. And uh, the the author uh, uh, Sharia Ben, who who is a playwright, uh, she found out things that I didn't even know about the Jackson Rooming House. It's just amazing, and the music was spectacular. So uh, I'm glad you saw that. now let me uh, introduce uh, Barbara Clarksdale, known as the Cemetery Lady, because of caretaking at the historic Midland Cemetery years ago. The moniker has been used for her introduction prior to presentations for the living history interpretation of several area women who lived during the early to late 1800s. In doing so, the student of all ages can obtain a better picture of the history that impacted America from slavery to freedom. The historic Midland Cemetery is located in Swatara Township, and it's the resting place for slaves Three men, United States colored troops, Buffalo soldiers, and numerous leaders of the area's, area's African American community. Barbara serves as president of the Friends of Midland Cemetery uh, and chair for the Pennsylvania Hallowed Grounds, where her experience of caring for the cemetery can be shared with cemeteries around the state and the country. <coughs> Actively involved, with the exposure of local black history has brought reenactors to the uh, of, of the United States colored troops and the Buffalo soldiers to the area uh, during Midland Memorial Day celebrations and to area schools for special programs. Midland serves as a tourist spot uh, and increasing travelers to area hotels and other sites of interest within Swatara Township and surrounding areas. Friends of Midland received the Pennsylvania uh, Preservation Award from the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission for their restoration efforts of the Midland Cemetery. Uh, and Midland Cemetery was listed on the National Register of Historic Places uh, just last year. Barbara is known as a local historian, writer, genealogist, presenter, and caretaker of history. Today she is our facilitator. Our time is flying, so what I'm going to do now is introduce our panelists up here, and we're going to get started, and hopefully we'll be able to give you lots of wonderful information, and whatever we can't give you tonight, we're going to ask you to give us some questions, uh, either write them down or give them to us at the end of this uh, session so that we can put them online so that you can get your answers that way also, and I'm sure Joanne will help us with uh, what that is. Okay, so we're, we're, yes. I'm going to interrupt you. Here we go. Our, our, our sponsor and, and uh, uh, benefactor for tonight's program, Peggy. Uh, uh, hey, bro. Peggy Grove. Peggy Grove. <laughs> 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 here, and I just want to introduce and recognize Peggy. With you. And if you would like to say a few words, please do. Hi, everybody. Hi. And, um, 
I just want to say a couple of things. First of all, I'm on the cemetery committee for the Jewish community. And, uh, and I have been interested in, in uh, restoring tombstones, etc. cetera, ever since I was a kid when I used to get tipped over in the room and that. And um, my grandmother lived in Daly City, and the Presidio is where the Buffalo Soldiers were housed and started, were trained to start with. And when Steve Reed first was thinking of doing the Civil War Museum, I said to him, why don't you do the Buffalo Soldiers? This, this city has got 65% African American or other people of color, and you owe it to them to do that. Well, he did not. I was on city council at the time, but he obviously didn't listen to me. <laughs> and the other thing that recently happened was the tree falling on the cemetery. And uh, I know that they're looking for volunteers as well as donations to help with the restoration of that. So if um, you know of anyone who might be interested in doing either, please let David know or anyone up here in front. And uh, thank you so much for coming tonight. And, and I am thrilled to have some historians give me more information about these things. Thank you. Thank you. about the uh, Lincoln Cemetery tree fall a couple hours ago. I have had con contact from several people who have already offered to help. So Good. there is a, a, a movement of foot thanks to your uh, instigating. So thank, thank you. Back to you, Barbara. That's okay. That's okay. I've been trying to help Lincoln for a number of years, and so the, uh, the journey goes on. You know, it's part of the Oh, 
work with that school. Actually, the board um, versus the Brown versus the Board of Education, okay, that was like at the end of the 50s, okay, when we were starting to really integrate into schools. Now, at that time, I'm sure that you were a young little person beyond the toddler's age, but also your maybe the sleepy bitch years of your life. You know, can you recall anything that your parents had to, get, to endure to, you know, make sure that you were going to be into the right school district, the right school area? Were you from, uh, let's say, you have two schools here, right? The John Harris and the William Penn? black community there, black businesses there, and when we, we all went to school together, and like I was sharing the other day, we could, they, you know, be outside with them, but we were never allowed in their homes. You know, they would, you know, they, and, and that, no one ever talked about it, you know. So that, you know, we didn't, we didn't finally realize that we were being segregated or, you know, there was prejudice until I moved on to high school. So, um, but we all went to school at, at both school, and, and we all was in the classroom together. But our parents always said, well, you can't go here, and you can't go there. Mm -hmm. And we didn't go, you know, I come from a mother and father home, and then both my mother and father went home, and they both worked. So what would happen is, we had to come home for recess, mm -hmm. and so my parents worked, so they, my mom would pay, I think it was, uh, Keystone Restaurant. They were okay, across the street. They were not on that okay, right across the street where McCarroll's was. And so they would have my lunch ready so they didn't have to go back to school. So, okay. you know, right. yeah, what about you, Millie? Well, there's a lot of things I can remember at that age. Of course, you made you emphasize that you were William Penn. I am. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Then we were, I must say, uh, I've been uptown and downtown and around town. That's the way the housing was. We went where there was adequate housing in what we believe to be decent neighborhoods, just like we do today. And so therefore, I was basically for my early years raised by my grandmother. So I went to Lincoln. Now, you know, that, that was, to me, was a prestigious yeah, elementary yeah. school. <laughs> they had wonderful teachers. Yeah. The atmosphere was wonderful. And the neighborhoods that we visited were neighborhoods that out of which came doctors, and then they had moved out and it, it left housing for uh, what I consider as our people moving into decent neighborhoods. That always comes when you get advancements and you're doing well, you know, you look for better neighborhoods. But the thing that I remember the most uh, during that time is they kept us sheltered so that we didn't have a whole lot of ill will and animosity. 
They made it so that although there were problematic ends of things, they made it so that the little people's journey was pleasant as possible. I can remember what happened at Lincoln. Matter of fact, I had a teacher named Miss Condon. Oh my goodness. <laughs> she loved that pointer. <laughs> I didn't care who had the pointer. She was supposed to point out the chalkboard with it. But somehow it made it to my fingers. <laughs> what were you doing? Well, I was left-handed. She was trying to break me from being left-handed. No, I was a softball, too. Yeah, that's what she did. We all made that up. But I tell you, at the end of the day, you can understand and feel the atmosphere of love, which is necessary anywhere we go. Even intention, there was, is with the better intention, but it's hard to bring it up out of people. I can remember being able to go out in the yard and play. From sunrise to sunset, and it was a wonderful time. Yeah. As I got older, I began to understand other things. There were complications. People weren't as drawn together as they perhaps should have been. But it was never so bad that we just couldn't figure out how to find common ground. What, can, what do I have to be thankful for? Oh my, a grandmother that cared she seen that it was necessary for us to have housing where there was always a backyard and I could go out and play. And I had wonderful uncles that were there. So they were kind of guides. They kept me in line as much as I could. And there were wonderful classmates. Do I remember how the scene was arranged? Pretty much like it is tonight. We sat, but there was always the teacher's pets up front. Of course. But there was always noticeable about what I loved about the teachers where they, they, they looked to see what was on the inside of us. And there was a lot of good on the inside of us. That work that made any struggle that and may have ever existed as I was a little person worth the struggle and worth the graduating point. As I moved on, I ended up uptown. My mother came and picked me up. We all have histories pretty much like this. Without a grandmother, some of us would have never made it. Mm -hmm. Those grandmothers knew how to put it in order. They say to me, even now, in order to be a good parent, you have to wait till you become. Thank you, all <laughs> You see. So as I got up to it, it was relatively easy. Now, there were things that was, I was conditioned for, always on a peaceful note. But what do you do with a wild little boy that has this ego? And that ego wanted to soar high. So, of course, a town was totally different. But I did have an opportunity with Mr. Edwards and Mr. Kinsey at Benjamin Franklin. There you go. So they had a good versatility of teachers and the atmosphere was set, and it was pretty much pleasant. There we learned to become conditioned with what was going to be sometimes an upset and other times a major victory in the lives of little people like ourselves as we would come along in Harrisburg. Thank you. Now, you mentioned, both of you have mentioned uh, things about being uh, a young person in mm -hmm. Harrisburg schools and sometimes the same teacher, mm -hmm. you know, but have you ever thought about as a, a young person about the children that aren't in your circle of life, you know, and I'm referring to our young ladies who, um, you know, because we all are, most people, let's say everyone at the one decided to take, right. was raised in a church somewhere, mm -hmm. and because of that, we faithfully went to church, mm -hmm. you know, my parents, <laughs> You want to go to church on a Sunday, you're going to be there all day long, and if it comes Wednesday, you're going to be there then, you know, you don't even think you're going to be in school all day, if you got homework, you better do it before or after because you want to be in church, and if you're not in church, you're going to be here in that church because you're going to learn how to pray, you're going to learn how to do all kinds of wonderful things and say you, uh, the Ten Commandments, and you're going to learn, my, the Lord is my shepherd and everything else, right, and so therefore, we spent a lot of time at church, even during the summertime when school was out, we also had church where 
we had uh, Bible, uh, Bible, Bible school, school, okay? So we spent a lot of time in the church, upstairs and downstairs. Yeah. And bringing that downstairs, I think about those young girls that had to endure and mm -hmm. died in the bombings. What did that do to your lives when you heard about that? Because we were all about the same age, between yeah. the ages of 10, maybe to 12 or 13. And, you know, in my thoughts, when that happened, I was afraid to go to church, you know, even though our parents, you know, not the same day, but made us go within a week or two, uh, go to church because of, um, we can't be fearful of people coming to kill us, you know, because we're in church. But how did that affect you folks? Well, for me, it was traumatic. And I was always afraid that would happen. But my parents both were from the South. And I can remember, my mom would always take me to Virginia every summer. We'd go to Virginia and go to South Carolina. And I never understood, you know, they had the colored only, or white only. I never understood that. But then when that happened, mm -hmm. I was afraid. And my mom said, no, you can't go over there. And I always wanted to be the one, yeah, I'm going over there. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. And she, and she would just snatch me up, you know. But I was always... Afraid that that would happen here in Pennsylvania. You know, I was born and raised here in Harrisburg, and it was really traumatic because I couldn't believe that something like that would happen with the girls in the church. Because you were young, I was young and yeah, right, right. We're all we're all, all in that same age yeah, group. Yeah, and that, that, that really, I can still remember it when it happened. Mm -hmm. you know? Willie, what about you? Not that you know, you can deal with the female part of it, but. Yeah. But any time that there's life loss, and in most cases we heard the adults talking about it because it leaves a, a bad representation of any people. And the things that I felt was that everyone was talking about being so humane and how could you have such inhumane actions. Mm -hmm. Everyone was expressing that they had a background that they were so saintly and they were passing it on to uh, under-deprived people, but who were the under-deprived people? What I remember is the fact that it was lives that was lost mm -hmm. and that we cannot get back. And yet and still, somehow, there had to be a band-aid that would put everything back together. And I remember the most about so many people then, after the mistakes that had been made, beginning to come together and trying to work things out. Even to the point that I used to often hear the pastor that I served under would say that where they came and relocated up in this area, that there were neighbors that they understood some of the fight of life. And they would take potatoes Roma across the street at the door after they left groceries on the door for them to come get it. So there was always a band-aid there, and I was led to understand that uh, we should move always. So I've always tried it. I didn't say I wasn't <coughs> angry at all, because anger will come up. But I recall what was taught to me. You get, be quick to anger, but <coughs> slow to wrath. And the thing that was established in me that and I think, I, I think so very highly of, and especially in 68, just prior to that, about the message that Dr. Martin Luther King had left for us. It was a message of sobriety. And whether they knew it or not, all people were equal and on the rise. And it was God's determination, and there's never been a time that God hasn't seen his people through. I heard you speak about the Jewish nation, and they left a pattern for us, a primary example as to why we should be supportive of one another in any and every situation. There's always a peaceful solution. It's not always about us, but about everyone that surrounds us, too. How did I feel? I felt like that was the loss of life that should have been cherishable. What have we done? Have we grown? And most certainly, when we see an assembly like this tonight, it shows and speaks for the growth that we have come to in America. <coughs> Even now, the concerns for each other 
in our young people because we got to continue to reach out and pick them up and help them understand you are somebody and you're able to do all things through Christ. I'm going to let it go. <laughs> So why would, why would it be just a shelter for some and not for all? Why would you want the, the religious freedoms and then you were going to redemonstrate the arrogance of, of, of inhumanity? Here, what do I remember? Yes, I put up my fist. <laughs> I most certainly did. And in the shadows, there were so many other people that were putting up there. <clears throat> and you know, it was just to say, that we desire to be a part of that which is moving forward. I believe that's what it was told to Moses to tell the people it's time to move forward. You can't continue old practices here in this day and age and expect to move forward. And now that we know who we are, because we are a part of history, it's necessary for us to be able to become united and stand because divided, you can't bring someone in your house and expect for them to be broken all their life. 
Then again, whose house is it? <laughs> <laughs> that's the that's the well, I have brought some pictures along, as you see, I'm putting them up as we're going through the conversation here. And this is kind of what really sticks out at me. And this is one where we're sitting at the, um, you know, the counter in protest of having to, you know, to go through the back door. Uh, and, and this is what I'm showing them. And it, it's not a local thing as far as these people here, because this was actually in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't say it didn't happen here in Pennsylvania or even downtown Harrisburg, because I can remember my mother taking me to the bottom, bottom end of the counter <laughs> so we could get our food because we were not allowed to sit on the other side. I also remember us being shuffled to the back of the bus. Okay, and I, you know, I thought it was fun to go to the back of the bus. Mm -hmm. the window, <laughs> and say, my daughter be I had no clue we were back there because we were black. All right, but as you grow older, I can remember the bus driver as my mother would put me on the bus to take my accordion lessons down at J.H. Troops. She could sit up front mm -hmm. and he would lift, help me up and down the steps with my big old accordion. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a breakthrough for me. You know? but anyway, did you ever have a situation like that? And I'm going to start a gym with you this uh, Yes. Um, there were some establishments that um, we had to go into the, around the back, or to the side. We couldn't go inside. I won't name them. Privately, she will. But um, I can remember that, and I can remember my parents saying, we're not allowed to go over here, especially when it was uh, trying to go over across the river. The only time we went across the river was when my mom had to go over and clean homes. Mm -hmm. And um, even as I, in our later years, it was still that way. And that, I was always the one that went, wanted to go, you know, because I was the brave one of this. <laughs> but um, I, I never understood it. Nobody could explain to me why. And then, here we go. We have, we have um, because of your color, you couldn't go over there. Because of your color, you had to sit at that end of that, that five and ten cents mm -hmm. you know, there. There were certain times we could go over to the stores, you know. Mm -hmm. So, but around in this area, we had a lot of black um, business owners. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have to go out of our community with, with so much. Do you remember Martha's? Mar Martha's yeah. turn table. Yeah. And I thank Mr. Rick Banks over there because he, he told me, he, he started bringing up places that I had forgot about. Uh -huh. We had Leverage Funeral Home, we had yeah. a funeral home. Mm -hmm. yep. We yeah. had our, Shepherd's Driving we had, School. Yeah, we had Mr. Judge and uh -huh. uh, Mr. They had all our, their own uh, schools. Of course, gas station. You know, the gas station. Yeah. You know, we had, and so we didn't have to go out of that community for anything really because everything was right there for us. And I can remember my mom telling me when she first moved here, you know, downtown was all black. She said it was like Wall Street to her, you know, because they had their own business before they claimed them in the domain right. and with the state with the buildings. State buildings. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So yeah, I've got some fantastic yeah. stories from mm -hmm. some of the elders before yeah. they passed on. Yeah. They used to live there in that region. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Some of my yeah. 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 Um, and really good about you. I can remember that school. Yeah, yeah. And, and I can remember the movie theaters and all, oh, yeah. and how we would come together, especially, especially over, over here on Columbia. Anyway, anyway, we had the yeah. Okay. 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 <laughs> <laughs> there was something that gave us the sense of closeness, but there were those, like myself, I refused to stay, I say, I refused for you to come where I could not go. I don't mind taking a little abuse, but that has to end at some point. So I was always wandering outside of the boundaries. As a matter of fact, I can I can remember so vividly how many times did I wander outside of and then you know I would get in trouble. Yes. There was one thing that always helped me. I was taught to have a great deal of respect for adults. So therefore, with that respect, it kind of made things passive. But as far as where I can't go, 
Maybe I just didn't understand. Or maybe I felt that that wasn't God's will. And that I was willing to suffer that his will would be done for the purpose of others. So I was always wondering out. I was always trying to cross the page to the other. Boundary, yeah. Well, no boundary. I was, I was going, I was going to go where I was not supposed to be. But you know, things worked out simply because it was a time for all to become refreshed and revived. So therefore, I can actually have that which I can pass on to my children as I got older to let them know, yes, there's not a neighborhood that you can't be introduced to. There's not a people that you can't meet and greet. And whenever you find somebody and you say good morning to me, and they say what's so good about it, you just look up and say, I can see everything that's so very good about this morning. And keep it moving. So we need to understand, we too, yeah. Uh, did I ever join in on some that pulled themselves together and tried to march across the state street for it? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Everybody has a following, and then we still we learn the rights from the wrongs, and we learn within the rights from the wrongs that we do all have rights. Then either one of you have an elder in your family, you miss in your church or whatever that could speak to you about the march from Washington, you know, with the fight of Martin Luther King or any other gatherings that happened there for equal rights um, during the civil rights period, the early civil rights period, because we're still enduring the civil rights now. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do I hit it. Well, yeah, because the pastor that came under, he, he was summoned in, and he was summoned everywhere. He was down in Washington. There's, a, there's an awful lot of things. I came up under a pastor project. Okay, a little louder here. Okay, okay. I had a pastor that was just known, you know, so whenever something went on, and he was of the very postal nature, but he also understood. So they talked about how the march, how the people showed up, the sacrifices that even have to be made today to become a part of that, and how we should be able to properly represent ourselves as a people. Yeah, I had, a, I had I had many the doctor the, the Reverend Doctor the very Reverend Doctor Nathan Baxter. Okay. Yes. Okay. And now now I served under his father. Oh my! Oh my! Oh my! You see? You see? So so we know that I would not sit here and tell you any untruth. And he was a man that could stand flat footed, and he told he spoke right from wrong. He stood before many presidents, had many invitations, and he also, also promoted in us to do it the right way so that we would prevail. And today, we are yet prevailing. So, did I? Yes. Did I understand what the opposition was? Yes. And without a sacrifice, but then haven't we experienced that of the ultimate sacrifice that was made for all of us. Yeah, well, he brought up a good point by Reverend Baxter because he was, we kind of looked up to him in the community. You know, his son and I, we went to school together, we graduated together. And um, he, was, he was very adamant about us learning our history. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I can remember watching it on TV. I can remember watching it on TV and I was like, wow, been there, you know. I would love to have been there, but there were people that, you know, as like you mentioned, that they were in the church. They they were there. People were ever older than I was were there. Um, but I was just so fascinated with seeing all those people come together, you know, black, white, whatever. And it was peace. And it was peaceful. Yes, that was just amazing to me. Yes. Have you ever noticed when that type of peace has existed there? There is not a, a large tolerance for trouble then because there's, there's always the giver of the peace that has everything organized and it has a direction. So, so, so it behooves us to continue on in this end of the legacy because I believe the dream that he had, 
I believe the dream Martin Luther King had. He said he was at to the mountaintop. I believe that. And we yet have to see the mountaintop for ourselves. And there's only two ways to pray. Either for or on. Choose.
I was hired by UGI. And I went in under the impression they can do nothing that I can't do. Because gifts weren't just given to some, but you have to apply yourself. Mm -hmm. So I went from a street foreman to, oh my, I was, when I left there, I was one step from a technician. I had everything that they had in every department, in every way. As a matter of fact, when I left there, or separated in 1992, but let me back up a little bit. Was there opposition? Yeah, yeah, it was funny. Did I have a, my own crew? Yes, 1285 was my truck. <laughs> Could I handle the job? I was apt to stay up all night long. I was their troubleshooter. I was taught by some of the best. Knew how to locate. Had I got caught by gas? Yes, clapped in a ditch. They had to pull me out. Okay. All I could remember is pleasant things. Like I was in the backyard, that's how quick it came. So maybe there's a thing that death can do for you. Well, I went on from there. And I left because I had a lot of tools under my belt. So I started my own business. Was I any good? Yeah, I can install furnaces. I can install hot water tanks. So I just made me a little card. And I put it out there. And guess what? I wasn't hungry. And I had an honest job. But I wanted to go back to work. And I always heard about the state. So in, let me see if I can. 1894, Bishop Milton Thompson mm -hmm. bought an application. He was with the state. He had gotten a lot of people hired on. So he, I filled it out, and that's how I ended up with the Department of Agriculture. <coughs> I don't think I was quite, because I had to work weekends, and it kept me out of service. But that was a matter of talking to the Lord about that. In the seventh year of being there with them, they tried to walk past me for someone that was my lesser and place them and give them their, so their weekend was off. And I had to remind them. At that time, the union stepped in. And they said, we're looking for a capable person that can represent these people. Let me help you. I had never lost a case while I was in the chair seat. Mm. Why? Because I've always acknowledged God. And so a fair practice was done. And then, oh, I did 23 years for them. And I decided it was time for me to retire. Thank God for retirement. Mm. <laughs> was there opposition? There will always be opposition. It's how you handle the opposition. If we can see clearly, which I believe so many of us can now, opposition is right in front of us as a black community and for all of those that are surviving that want to see this thing done right. I will say this, I serve a just God and it will happen. Amen. I love that. I love that. And you know what, um, David, how much time do we have? Well, maybe another round of questions by you, Barbara, and then maybe open it up to the audience. Okay. Well, I'm going to ask one more question. And this is my last question for you folks. Um, and then I want to, again, meet the audience to share some questions with you. And we'll be able to answer them too. All right. And so, what do you think is important for today for our youth and so that uh, they don't have to, let's say they're going to stand on our shoulders, you know, so they don't have to go through this here um, racism, prejudice, uh, can't get the job, you know, even though they are more eligible and qualified than, what would you tell our youth to do to survive in our world here in Harrisburg or elsewhere as they move on and go off to college or go off to trade school or just go off to go play to work? What would you tell them? I always tell my grandkids, education is the key. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think for me that was the key, you know, and, I, and it has to be done, you know, that someone in the home has to tell them. Um, you know, when we were coming up, we had the why, we had, you know, we had 
people to look up to to help us get to where we need to belong. But for today, um, you know, I see a lot of kids dropping out of school. Some of the families that I deal with, you know, they drop out of school. There's no one there to tell them or to show them how to connect to the resources that they need. Um, and there's no one there to for them to look up to. We had community centers, we had all, you know, we had we had Girl Scouts right there, Boy yeah. Scouts right there, the church, you know. Um, and I and personally I think the churches need to step it up. Mm -hmm. That's I, that's my biggest beef. Mm -hmm. Churches need to come out of that pulpit and and reach out to these young kids and, mm -hmm. and, and get into the community. Mm -hmm. Community outreach is the key. Mm -hmm. And um, for me it was like I had things to do, you know. I had, I had, I had things to do in the community. You know, we, we had things to do. We went to the church, we went to vacation Bible school, we went Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, we went to the Y. You know, they had programs for us. So, a um, lot of the children today, you know, it's not, they're not all bad. No. They're not all, we have some smart kids out there. But we have some, we need people to be telling them, you don't have to live this way, you don't have to go in this direction. I, you know, if God did it for me, he'll do it for you. Mm -hmm. You know, I went down a dark path, but I came out of that dark path because somebody was there to support me and help me get to where I needed to be. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, you know, they need to be, you know, education is a key. Okay. Well, you want to add anything to that? Yes. We cannot keep bearing away from basic biblical principles. How can we change God's language? Our children don't even know who they are anymore. Mm -hmm. The schools do not have a right to change them or to promote their change. God said he made male and female. Mm -hmm. That's not, when we get back to the principles, we'll understand the rest of it. It's said for the church, we, and especially for the church, we should follow the fatherless. We should help deliver the oppressed. And we should remember the true widow. These are basic biblical principles. It can do not ever, please do not push on our children. Help them understand. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. When we get back to there, do we remember when they used to pray in school? Mm -hmm. Now they're praying on them in school. It's, it's, it's nothing but vow change from an A to an E. It was listed in the Old Testament. So here we are. When we go back to the fundamentals, we will see our children. Because the Word of God says they grow wiser but weaker each generation that comes in. Each generation. So with that, that aptitude, they can fly very high. They're very easy to learn, but they need that straight path to who they really are. Am I speaking against anyone? The word simply tells me to say to everyone, choose. Choose. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience? <coughs> question. Yes, sir. Um, what's your impressions of what was be known as the Harrisburg Race Riots of 1969 when uh, Mary Yancey had that at 13th and Market. I heard Mr. Caleb Jackson say that the school district was never the same after that. Yeah. That's yeah. true. Would yes. you agree with that? Did everybody hear or this question? <coughs> yes. yes. Okay. Or where were you guys when that was happening and what was your involvement or what was your state was of mind? I was in 11th grade. I was in 68. 68. Yeah, 68. I was in 11th grade. And I can remember standing at the bus stop at 6th and Division, get ready to go home, because we walked to school and we walked home. So I went and went over. Next thing I know, it was getting us off the street. They say the riot broke out. Um, and at that time, <coughs> we, you know, we all went to school with the There was a lot of Jewish neighbors and they lived you know, we went with them, all the Jews and the blacks all over the school together. And 
we didn't know what to do because we all we were in and out of each other's homes and we all studied together. We we you know we didn't know what to do. So we're standing there and they tell us get off the street. But at that time we didn't realize what we didn't have as blacks. And even as far as the teachers, as far as the library, you know, um, and, and you know we don't have to tear up our own neighborhood. I'm not I'm not pushing that. But you know they had to get some kind of attention to what was, what we were being deprived of. And for me, in '68, I was what 13 years old. But now let me tell you about the young part of it. <laughs> when we're young like that, we look at where the strength is at in yes. the movement. Yes. And then we are apt to become followers without knowledge. You know, there's things that we think we have a hold of, but we don't quite. And we look at those that are doing it, and they look like they're mature enough and strong enough to carry it off. And so therefore, we, tend, we have a tendency, and I said this earlier, I had a tendency, instead of being a leader, to be a follower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if they were walking around hollering black power, <laughs> let's do this, let's do this right. Because if there was a battleground there on all sides, when somebody kicked, we both took the bad example. Yeah. Everybody, kicked. You, 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 everybody right. kicked. Everybody kicked. And then when it finally dispersed, let's talk about fairness now, where we're at right now. When it dispersed, no matter who was on what side, what side got the worst punishment? So, yes, then... Many of us were followers. We were following those that seemed to have more experience. We figured they had the right way. As we've grown now, many of us should know better. Was the message made clear? Yes. But at the cost of what? How much did it cost us? A lot. And I Remember too, uh, it wasn't unusual to climb out the window and climb no, down. No, no, no. <laughs> yes, Miss Page. I lived here in 1963, and JFK's campaign was my first campaign when I was in high school. And um, we went to, I was 20 years old, and um, I had one year left, left of college, and I didn't come here voluntarily. It was, I asked. So anyway, um, and I could not believe when we went to buy a house two years later of, of the, the red lined deeds. In fact, there are still deeds that if you don't have a knowledgeable realtor, still have the five restrictions. No Italians, yep. no African people of color of any kind, mm -hmm. and they said blacks, but it also meant Hispanics or anyone else who, who had even a different color, like yellow or any, any color. And um, no Catholics. Um, and there was one other, well, Jewish, of course. Um, there was one more, I can't the Irish. Irish, Irish, yes. And Hershey especially. Um, there was a, a, a line drawn around the city, and the, the, the land is still owned by Hershey Corporation. You only lease the, the land in Hershey. And, and you do what you want on the house, etc. but they still own that land. And, um, and the Italians that built Hershey and did all that wonderful work in the Hershey Hotel and other places, they had to live outside of town. And they were they had uh, different grocery stores. They didn't have um, uh, fresh vegetables, just like the, the the food desert in the city of Harrisburg. Um, but I couldn't believe that that was still going on. I came from Reno, Nevada, and I lived down Black Springs, where all the black families had to live. 
as well as uh, any um, Native Americans who were kicked off the reservation for whatever reason, or several reservations, and I had a Jewish last name. So I was the lowest pecking order. Kids, African American kids beat me up because the Jews were lower than the African Americans out there, as well as the Japanese, uh, because they were in internment camps, et cetera. So I go back, I'm 81 years old. And um, when I came here um, uh, in 1968, during the, the riots and things, they bused the white kids to Middletown School District where I was teaching because they were getting abused. And, um, and they were, by then, there were many more African Americans in the school than there were um, any other colors. And, um, and I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't, I could not believe what was going on. Then, so 68, the base closed. And, and Middletown, and, it, and it, when they closed, it was an Air Force base. They employed a lot of people of color. And, and, a lot of people of color. and, and Middletown had 25,000 people. Now they have around 10. Um, and the African American community there, just like in Carlisle, there was always a large African American um, uh, group of people there. Plus, um, then came around like the, the, the riots, and then the flood of 72, and then 79 finished off Harrisburg yeah. with the TMI. Yeah. I will tell you, it's a wonder we ever came back. I mean, uh, T, uh, um, the uh, nuclear oh. accident. Yeah. Yeah. So all of those things added together um, really colored the history of you becoming young adults starting your families, etc. Did you, when you went to buy your first house, did you have problems getting a loan? Oh, yeah. yeah. So did oh, I. Yeah. So did yeah. I. As a woman, we, women were just, you know, we, you had, the two women up here had it just worse than the men because African American men got the right to vote That's right. before <laughs> women of yeah. any kind yeah. were allowed to vote. And that's the, the, the uh, statues down at 3rd and, and uh, uh, Walnut, Walnut Street Walnut and Street, yes. Commonwealth Avenue. Right. That represents the 15th and the 19th Amendment. Mm -hmm. And there are people in this room that help make that happen. Yes, sure so, right. And that's the old age board it has all the list of the people. Yes, so, uh, and, uh, and I'm trying to get plaques out for the, the uh, the two synagogues that were up there, in addition to the OA board that had all the really old African American families. That was the first thrust. Now I'm trying to get the Irish and the, the other people in there too. But anyway, how 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 did you when you could buy a house? How did all this stuff affect you? Because this you were right in the middle of this thing, you know, especially you who were more in the seventies trying to trying to buy a house. And it was it was terrible. I I just couldn't believe it. Well, it takes me back to when um, we went out past Clay Street at one time, and then um, when we lived on Marion Street, my dad bought that house, and we still had outside facilities at that time. Mm -hmm. And then it was required that we have inside, so that, that was in the late 60s, or early 60s. And and I remember when he found that, got that house up on Jefferson Street. I thought I was going to, I thought I was moving somewhere, but <laughs> when Jefferson Street went, it was a half a lot past McClack. Yes, that was up uptown. <laughs> and um, the, uh, my dad bought it for taxes or something. And, um, and I can remember when we moved up there, how hard a time he had. At that time, Fulton Bank was right there on Third and Corner. Oh, thank, no, heavens for, Fulton thank, thank heavens for Fulton Bank. Yeah, and they were only bank that would finance black people to buy anything. And um, so we moved up there and um, stayed up there. We lived up there until I graduated from high school, and then I moved out. But when I bought my first home in um, 1980. 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 87, 87, I got married in 87. 87, 
I remember going to different banks. You know, and I was part of that first time home buyers program. I think that's what I meant to do. That's why she's so feisty, because she was like four hours. And um, they had a program that to save all your so much money to show that you could afford to, to buy the home or to leave and leave it home. So the, you know, you went to these, these banks turned, they didn't even look at the paperwork, they just took turned you away. So I ended up going through a realtor, a black realtor, to even get the home. And you could tell they they, they, they take all the information and you know, I, I didn't have bad credit, I had the money saved. You know, but for the down payment. Yep, yep, the down payment and all that. But they would turn you away. I got turned away so many times. Mm -hmm. And I knew why I got turned away. Sure. Well, women have the same problem. Yeah. As a and business, I was a single parent. Too. As a businesswoman, I can't tell you how many banks I went to. Yeah. But Fulton Bank was the one, yeah. and that is still using to this day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're one of the few that haven't been gobbled up by other people, and they chose that. They, they did. They chose not yeah. to do that. Uh, we have another question back here. When we moved here in the early 70s, we were attending the Hunt organization meetings. Harrisburg, Uptown, Neighbors yeah. Together, yeah. under the leadership of, just like that. <laughs> Betty Murphy. Oh, yes, yes. And the focus of that organization was, at that time in the early 70s, Harrisburg was getting large sums of money from uh, the federal government for slum clearance, and it was supposed to be slum clearance replaced by uh, yeah. adequate housing, but uh, they had to get private developers for that housing, and Harrisburg was unable to get private developers, but they still were moving and it was primarily in the African-American yeah. neighborhoods between 3rd and 7th Street, yeah. and that resulted in Lottsville mm -hmm. because they collected the slum clearance money and gave it to certain favored contractors to demolish. Yeah. And so Betty Murphy was leading sort of the fight yeah. to stop Harrisburg from getting, from accepting the money and tearing down without replacing. And there were uh, individuals attending the meeting that had been forced to move by right of eminent domain. They happened to have a livable house, but in a row which was viewed as, quote, slum, and they had to keep moving. I just wondered, did any of you have any involvement with Hunt, Harrisburg, Uptown, Neighbors Together, and the, the fight that it. was going on. I remember on. it, okay. but I wasn't involved. Yes, I do okay. remember that. What about you, Bob? Not in that particular end of it. I, I, I can't I can speak on that, but you brought up something about that in a minute. Right. We had gone through the history of some things that were on her street, mainly the state, the old state historics. Okay. And the property was taken from them or in them from them. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I, I know that there was a way that they were pulling things out around that time. Um, even now. And when I think about my first home, I, I really didn't have a problem. It was either Sovereign or Chase. Picked up our first mortgage. But I was on, I'm not, not that it made a difference when I was on the hill. Yeah. <laughs> hey, thank you. <laughs> but it came relatively easy, even the second home. And I remember the Enox had it on her street. Yeah. And as uh, soon as it went up for sale, because it seemed like everybody that I knew had a semi attached home hooked on with somebody else, and it was always so unhappy. We could carry them through the walls. And so a single home came up, and uh, they didn't want to qualify us there. But I was taught to trust what we prayed for. And 
they tried to turn us down and it flipped. And the next thing I knew, we were living there. <laughs> and we've been there ever since. <laughs> and so, but yeah, I know what the struggle was <clears throat> that it was to obtain a property. And then there's so many loopholes that we have to be mindful even right now in whatever community we're in because there's so much of exchange of different things. And so the quality of what we did have is deteriorating for something that's brand new. Back to that Harrisburg Uptown neighbor, they were, they, um, you remember the homes on Dolphin Street? They were responsible, they were supposed to get that money to remodel those homes. And they gave them these cheap materials to remodel those homes, and they didn't last, I don't, they didn't even last that long. But that was supposed to please us in the neighborhood. And I remember Miss Betty, I do remember her. Yes. <coughs> And Third Street, Third yes, Street yes, you are so right, you are so right. And the flood has sent, flood has sent me too. Really affected Lotsville also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, folks, I'm gonna, um, you know, kind of cut it off here because we are actually 15 minutes beyond the time that we were supposed to have for our discussion. I want to thank you all for um, a wonderful discussion up here, thank, thank you. the audience for uh, coming and. Um, listening and hopefully hopefully you learn something from it something that you can take home with you and you know help your own neighbors with and be more neighborly too around this country around this world so that we can all live in peace together and um you know if you have some stories to tell let us know and if you even have some questions to let us know i'm sure that david and joanne will be glad to gather those questions and send them off to us so that uh, our panelists can still uh, get in contact with you some kind of way, all right? But uh, I'm going to conclude this game this back over to Mr. David Morrison. And thank you. Thank you again for coming. Thank you. Thank you.